man. Welcome, you guys. Metanoia, we're so happy that you're here with us. If you're here for the first time, you're here uh, at a good time because we're actually starting a new series called What If? Okay, What If? That um, really is a heartfelt message that I want to share because the questions you ask determine the answers you'll get. Often we don't get certain answers in life because we don't ask certain questions. One of the reasons why this is dear to my heart is because um, I got saved in 2004 under a pastor. His name was Jerome Solomon, and um, he was a heroin addict and got saved under Pastor Freddy Garcia. And then he came and he opened up his own house, and I walked through the doors of that house and got saved under his ministry and and he got sick in 2007 um he got cancer and so we knew he was going to die about three years later he died 2010 in january and um one of my regrets was that i didn't ask enough questions i you know we spent a lot of time together he was always available i mean always available like i always had access to him and one of the issues was when he died i, I thought and I begin to reflect that I didn't ask him enough questions. He was a wealth of wisdom and knowledge and experience, and, and I just walked around as if I thought I knew what I was doing. Now, I asked him questions. I just didn't ask him enough. And, you know, I just, you know, thought I knew what I was doing. Sometimes, you know, the, the problem was uh, possibly is that I thought I should know uh, these answers because I was one of his leaders. And, you know, some things you just don't ask because you feel like, oh, okay, you don't want to look stupid or whatever. I don't know why. All I know is I didn't ask enough questions. And so, you know, one of the things we've heard in Christianity is that you can't ask God questions, which is a lie. You know, they say that you shouldn't ask God questions. That's not true. Actually, it was a guy named Abram, which God changed his name to Abraham. Uh, one time, God was about to destroy these two cities, and Abraham's nephew was there. And it, the cities was Sodom and Gomorrah. And he was going to destroy him. And so Abraham came to him and he began to ask him questions. He said, well, if there was 50 righteous people there, would you actually destroy this, these towns? And he says, no, no, I, I wouldn't do that. He says, well, Lord, uh, you know, I, I want to ask you one more question. What if it was 25 people? And the questions you ask, it says a lot about your approach to God, your intimacy with God how deep you think you can go. And so we're going to start this first part of the series. It's what if I could go deeper? What if I knew or what if I knew that I could go deeper with Jesus? What if I knew that I could go deeper in intimacy with Jesus? What if I could know Jesus on a deeper level? What if I knew? Because sometimes, you know, we're in a place in our walk with God, and in that place, you know, we, we kind of like just stay right there. We don't go deeper. We don't, we don't get to hear him in a more intimate way. We kind of like wait until Sunday come, and when Sunday come, hey, you know, I'm sure pastor got a word for me, or, you know, I'll speak to someone, or maybe, you know, someone will tell me, you know, what God is saying. But you can go deeper. You can actually get to know deeper Jesus in a deeper way. You can go to a deeper level with Jesus. It's so important for us to get this because often what's happening is, you know, we stay on this surface level with Jesus and Jesus has so much more for us and because we don't go deeper with him, we actually don't know what that is. And it's this man, his name once was Saul and he had an encounter with Jesus and they changed his name to Paul. And Paul went so deep with Jesus he went so deep with Jesus that, you know, he began to plant churches all over the world and he wrote majority of the New Testament uh, in the Bible, the, the, the New Testament portion of the Bible. And he had been walking with Jesus around 20, 30 years and he was still asking Jesus, man, I need to know you more. You know, he was still passionate about getting to hear God, to know God. To experience Jesus, to go deeper. 
And so today the question is, what if I could get to know Jesus on a deeper level? Okay, so we're going to look at a portion of the Bible in Philippians chapter 3 is so good because in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 11, it's amazing. Look what happens. This is going to teach us how to go deeper. Y'all ready? Yes. Okay, are y'all ready? Yes. Okay, so hopefully you're online, you're ready. We're talking about how we can go deeper with Jesus. Verse 7 of Philippians chapter 3 says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Verse 8 says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the value of knowing the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Verse 9 says, and becoming one with him, not only just knowing him, but becoming one with him. He was saying that my life is nothing. My life is nothing. And so he says, you know, I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. He goes a little deeper in verse 10. Look what it says. I want to know Christ. Now, you would think this guy would know Christ, right? You would think after walking with the Lord 20, 30 years, he would walk around with this arrogance as if he knows who God is. You can't tell me who God is. I know how to hear God. I know how to pray. I know how to worship. I know. But this guy says, I want to know Jesus. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power of that raised him from the dead. He says, I want to experience that mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him. Oh. He says, I want to know him so bad that I don't, I want to know all of Christ, even the suffering. I want to know all of it, even when he suffered, how he kept on going forward and he didn't complain and he didn't start blaming other people. He didn't start criticizing other people. He just went through it. Sharing in his death. Whoa. Verse 11 says, so that. One way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. One of the ways that we can actually go deeper into knowing Jesus is we got to remember. So important to remember where Jesus found you. It's so important to remember what Jesus done for you. It's so important to remember how God loves you, how God cares for you. Remembering is so important. Some people... They forget. And someone have to remind them, hey, man, you remember? And then they think that you're like being cocky by trying to help them remember where God found them so they can stay humble. I don't know how many times a week, but it's often that I wake up and I, and, and I wouldn't say I was in tears, but about in tears, remember when Jesus found me. I used to sleep in abandoned houses. You know, I just took a house one time, just stayed in there because I seen it boarded up. I ripped off the, you know, I didn't have nowhere to go. I was a drug addict. I just lived in there. I remember. I remember where Jesus found me. I know that's kind of extreme, and some people may not have those memories, but you still got to remember that Jesus is the only reason why you're not going to hell. You may not have the memories I had, and you may not have done what I've done, but you got to remember that, you know what, today I woke up because of Jesus today. I have a house and a roof over my head because of Jesus. We have to remember, verse 7 says, I once thought things, he said, I once thought these things were valuable. He says, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. He was going, he says, in order for me to go deeper in knowing Jesus, I need to remember how God found me. I got to remember what Jesus done for me. I got to remember that it's only because of the blood shed on Calvary. It's only because of his death that I'm here today and can live. It's only because of Jesus. He says, I once thought those things were valuable. What things? The things that he was clinging hold to. The, the life that he was embracing. 
the, the things, you know, because a lot of times what we do is we, we claim things are more valuable than what it really is. It's valuable today, but 10 years from now, it won't even be valuable. But you know what will always be valuable? Is a relationship with Jesus. You know, Jesus will always have value. He never depreciates. He never depreciates. He, you know what? And what you appreciate, appreciates. Let me explain. When you appreciate something, it appreciates in value. See, we, when we don't appreciate things, it, it devalues. It depreciates. It's so important for us to be grateful for what Jesus done for us. Somebody say, I remember. I remember. Verse 8 says it like this because he says, I once thought these things were worthless. And then look what he says. Yes. Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says everything, everything. And Paul is extreme with this. He says everything. He says, I can compare my wife to Christ. Don't measure up. So why would I spend more time with my wife? You know, it would, which caused me not to be intimate with God. It's nothing wrong with me having time with my wife, but if it's going to get in the way of me being intimate with God, you know what? That means I'm valuing you more than Christ. When I begin to start valuing, you know, my, my children and my job and my business more than Christ, you can tell when you value it more because you spend more time with that than you spend with Jesus. It's so important. It says, yes. Everything else, somebody say everything else, else. is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. He says it's, it's not even a comparison. He says for this sake I have discarded, meaning I got rid of, I got rid of everything else, counted as garbage so that I could gain Christ. What he was saying, I'm not saying throw the baby away with the bathwater. I'm not saying that, but I am saying we have to learn how to get our priorities in order. Because not only do we need to remember, in order to go deeper, we, not only do we need to remember, you know what we need to do? We need to reevaluate. We need to reevaluate our priorities and see if we got them in its proper place. I don't know how many times I've had to done this, do this as a Christian, and I have done this as a Christian, as a believer, as a pastor, having to reevaluate, re- reassess my life. And say, man, I, you know, I'm spending too much time on this TV. <laughs> you know, I, 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 man, I just watch these episodes. <laughs> I went through the whole, I, I binge watched <laughs> the whole season. Man, that, if I would spend time in God's word like that, I got I to gotta watch it. I got to watch out. I got I to gotta stop screen time at a certain time. Me and my wife will go through a season where screen time, 7 p.m., no screen time, no phone, no TV, no iPad, screen time, it's over. Because if we're going to spend that much time on the screen, I should spend that much time before Jesus. Because I have to reevaluate. In order for me to go deeper in my relationship with Jesus, I need to reevaluate my life. I need to reevaluate. And this is what the Apostle Paul was saying. Apostle Paul says, you know what? In comparison... To everything else, he's comparing everything else. In comparison to anything else, you know what? There, it's not even close, verse 8. It's, it's not even close. He says, yes, everything else is worth this when compared to the infinite value. Look where he uses this adjective, the infinite value. He wants to explain this. Infinite, I meaning there's unlimited resources. In unlimited value. Infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus. He says, for this sake, I discard everything else. And I count it as garbage. In comparison, remember he's talking about you count it as garbage in comparison to who? Jesus. That don't mean my wife is garbage. Never that. That don't mean my kids are garbage. Never that. That don't mean I discard a job. Never that. I need money to pay my bills. You know, that don't mean that I discard, you know, uh, having time with my kids. That's valuable. But in comparison or compared to my relationship with Jesus, it's not even close. He says, I need to reevaluate. In order for me to go deeper, I need to reevaluate my priorities. What is my priority? What's on the top of the list of my priorities? Now, it's easy to say it, but it's another thing to do, right? 
You know how we say Jesus is number one? Of course he is. Of course he's number one. What do you mean? Like no one's going to say he's third. But when you reevaluate, I don't know how many times I've had Jesus no, at third. I've had ministry, meaning serving other people. That was number one. And you can always, that was real tough because you can say, well, I'm doing it for Jesus. But ministry was number one. Then I had my wife, number two, and then Jesus. Then I've had my wife, number one, me, number two, then ministry, then Jesus. Oh, Jesus dropped down to four. And I have to reevaluate. In order to go deeper, I have to reevaluate what is going on here. My job is number one now. What's going on here? My money's number one now. What's going on here? And those things are, they're not garbage, but in comparison. Are y'all getting that? In comparison to my relation, because none of that could have saved me. I had money before I met Jesus, and it didn't stop me from going to hell. I had girlfriends and women before, you know, I met Jesus, and it never saved me. You know what I'm saying? I had businesses before I met Jesus, and it never saved me. Jesus is the only one that could save me from the pits of hell, so he's more valuable than everything. He has to be. He has to be more valuable. So it's so important. Verse 9, he, he goes deeper. The apostle Paul's going deeper saying, remember, he says, he says I want to become one with him. Like, he, like, I want people to see me, and when they see me, they see Jesus. He says, I want to become one. I want to become aligned with him. I want to be on the same page with Jesus. You know, when, when I speak, it sounds like Jesus. When I make a decision, it's, it's, it's like Jesus would make it. He says, I want to become one with him. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. He says, I don't even want to begin to start putting myself on a pedestal thinking that I can be right with God on my own, on my own strength. He says, you know what? I no longer count my own righteousness. He says, I become righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. It's not in our own strength. Watch this verse 10. He says this. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. So not only did he need to remember just like we need to remember. Not only do we need to actually, you know, reevaluate, but also we need to refocus. In order to go deeper with Jesus, we got to refocus. He was focused on his own abilities. He says, you know what, I'm going to discard. I'm, I'm going to get rid of my own righteousness. Let, let me explain what own righteousness is. Like, own righteousness is this. Like, you think that you are right with God because you do good stuff. You open up the door and say, yes, ma'am. Now, there's nothing wrong with having courtesy like that, but that don't make you right with God. You know, no, it would make you wrong if you just slammed it on the back. You know what I mean? Obviously, you know, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Do not do that. But I'm saying that don't, I mean, our own works. Oh, I come to church. I pay my tithes. I do. You know, he said, I'm getting rid of the right, my own righteousness because he was this guy that knew all the Bible. He knew a lot of the scriptures and he was depending on his righteousness to be right with God. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's not what might make me right with God. He says, I'm going to have to refocus. You know, when you refocus, it causes you to look at things from a different view. You know, have you ever been around people and, and, and you, you'll see something and you'll see it in a negative way and then somebody else will walk over and say, no, it's okay. It's, it's fine. No, no, it's okay. Stop. You don't have to get mad. It's okay. And you're all frustrated because your focus is off. You know how, like, you get a camera. When you get a camera, you know, you have to, you know, like, I'm not good with cameras. So I would get the camera, and it would probably look distorted. You look over this way, it looks good. You look at the lens, you're like, man, what's wrong? And then someone that's a professional, they'll come and twist the lens and, and focus it, and then you look in there and everything's clear. See, many times in life, our focus get off. Our focus get off because we're not going deeper with Jesus. We're not, we're like at the place we were two years ago in our relationship with God. You know, we're, we're where we were five years ago in our relationship with God. Well, we go to church, you know what I'm saying? Amen. Praise God. Lift up that hand up in the air when worship go and, and back up out of there and just go and get up out of there, right? You know what I'm saying? I did what I was supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? I, I punched my clock, right? But Jesus wants us to go deeper. 
He wants us to go deep because he has so much in store for us. And it all depends on us going deeper in the intimacy with him. It's all based on whether you go deeper with him. I go deeper with him. What if you could know Jesus on a deeper level? You think that's possible? Do you think you know all of who Jesus is now? It's impossible that we know. It is a never-ending journey. It's a never-ending journey. We, We get to know him, you know, Better and better as time goes by, as we put forth the effort of getting to know him. And one of the things we need to do, we need to remember where Jesus found us. We need to remember what he's done for us. We can, when we remember, we have gratitude flowing from out of us. We're just so grateful. We're so grateful because of the simple fact that, you know what, Jesus, I remember what you've done. I'm going to tell you the opposite of remembering and being grateful is, is complaining. So, so we need to remember, we need to reevaluate, get our priorities in order, and we need to refocus. When we don't focus on the right thing and we're not focused on the main thing, we're not focused on Jesus, it causes everything to be distorted. It's blurry. You don't see it properly. You don't see it clearly because you're not focused on the right thing. The focus is off. When the focus is off, you don't see things clearly. It just happens. It reminds me of a man that, and a woman that stopped at a, at a gas station. They were getting their, their uh, gas, and this is back in the day when they had full service. Now, you have to be a little bit older to realize what full service is. If you were born in the 80s or 90s, let me explain, okay? Full service is when they actually would pump your gas for you, and you give them a tip, and they would actually clean your windows and everything like that. That would be cool now, right? Well, they were at this old rural country town where they still done that. So a little kid came out and he started cleaning the windows and the wife went to go get some things out of the store. And the, and the husband was sitting there behind the wheel and the young man kept on cleaning the window. And the man rolled down his window and said, again, it's still dirty. So he cleaned it again and, and the little boy came and he was coming to get his tip. And he says, again, man, it's, it's dirty, bro. Can't you see that? And so he cleaned it again, and then the wife was sitting down. He says, this, these young boys, they need to really learn how to work. He was telling his wife that. He says, this boy can't even clean the window. She says, it's clean. What is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? She grabbed his glasses, and she cleaned the glasses, and then put it back on him, and it was clear. And that's what happens a lot of time. It's not that it's dirty, and it's not that it's mucky, and it's not that it's distorted, and it's not that it's even bad. It's just the lenses you have on. And so we have to refocus. But we have to refocus in life because some people will take your hand and win with it. Like some people, they'll take your hand like the cars have been dealt with you, and they'll win. Because, you know, they're focused on the proper thing. We need to refocus. Somebody say refocus. Refocus. So not only do we need to refocus, remember he said in verse 10 and 11, let's pick back up on verse 10 and verse 11. He says, I want to know Christ. And experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him. He didn't, he's saying, I don't want just a little bit of Christ. I want all of him. I want everything, even the suffering, even the beating, even when they ridiculed him and they falsely accused him. Yeah, that's part of, that's part of Christ. Some people get falsely accused and somebody lie on them. They start crying and trying to defend themselves and explaining and posting stuff and, and doing all kinds. Just to defend that, hey, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. Please help. And it's like, that's part of Jesus. Jesus was falsely accused and never said a mumbling, mumbling word. He was lied on, didn't even defend himself. He says, you know what Paul said? I want to be treated like this. And he got it. Paul was backstabbed by friends. Paul Paul was beaten, stoned. Paul actually was shipwrecked, and he was like a night, a day and a half. He was just just like on a piece of wood out there in the middle of the sea, just, just waiting for God to save him. He was experiencing all of Christ. He didn't experience just the blessing and hearing God. And knowing God's will for his life, because, you know, Jesus knew that. Jesus knew what the Father wanted out of him. So that's one portion of knowing Jesus. But he says, I want the suffering too. Going deeper. He says, actually, I even want to share with your death. 
Like, I want to die. I want to die to myself. I want to die to my selfish ways. I want to die to being so selfish. Don't, have you ever been so selfish that it hurt you? I have. Like, you're just so selfish. You, you're so selfish, you, and you know it. You're so selfish. Nobody don't even want to be around you no more. It's all about you. Anybody? Anybody sitting in your chair? Anybody watching your tablet? Anybody watching your telephone? That have been this selfish, where it just affects not only other people, but it affects you. He says, you know what? I won't even die. Verse 9, verse, verse, verse 10 says, I won't even die. He says, you know what, I want, I want to die with you, Christ. I want to die to him. But he's not saying physically. He's saying he want to die to himself. He want to die to his sinful nature. He says, I know this is the only way I can go deeper with you. Look what he says. So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. He says, I know that if I die, the only person who can resurrect me is you. Something, sometimes things have to die. Have you, have you ever you know, had things die, not physically, but things, you know, hopes die and God resurrect them. My whole life was dead. When I came to Christ, my whole life was dead. My aspirations, my desires, the things that I wanted for my life never came to pass. It was dead. And Jesus resurrected a whole new life for me. He resurrected a whole new life. Everything that I wanted was over. I wanted to be a football star. Then it shifted to, I want to be, you know, like Tony Montana, some of the biggest drug dealer. None of that worked. It died. It became the worst addict, I felt like, ever. And Jesus said, well, if you give me that life, I can resurrect it. So not only do we need to remember in order to go deeper, not only do we need to remember, we need to reevaluate, we need to refocus, but also we need to resurrect. What do you need to resurrect in your life? You got to identify, you may have never even been close to what I was. But whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever hope that you was holding on to, whatever promise that you was holding on to, whatever aspiration that you were holding on to, whatever dream that you had and it was shattered, now sweep it over there towards Jesus and see what he can do with it from there. It might not look like what you wanted it to. Because my life don't look like what I wanted it to. But he can, he can resurrect it from the dead. Amen. The only way you can receive a resurrection is if you recognize you need one, that you're dead. The situation's dead. And as I close this up, I want you to get this. I want you to get this clearly. The only way that you can receive a resurrection is when you die. Then when there's a death. It's so important for us to get that because sometimes we are, we're denying that it is dead. We're trying to resuscitate it ourselves. It's so important to get this. Get this. For 10 years, I tried to change my own life. 10 years. I was trying everything I could. I relocated. I, I lived in five different states trying to relocate just to think, oh, it's the environment. It was me. No matter where I went and ran, <sighs> Whew, I was taking the problem with me, me. I was the problem. My focus was off. I, I was real, real messed up. I mean, it's like, so, so everywhere I went, I took me with me. Get this. It was only when I finally said, man, I can't do this anymore. I'm dead. This is over. I didn't use those words dead, but I came to the Lord and said, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of fighting. They say that Ranchers, they'll have a bull that's stuck in the mud. And a new rancher will sit over there and try to lasso him and try to pull him out of the mud. And when those old veterans, they'll pull down their little tailgate on their truck and they'll sit down on their tailgate and just wait for the bull to get tired. Once he's tired, then he'll lasso him and get his truck and pull him on out of the mud. Until he's tired, he's going to keep on fighting. And you're going you're gonna to be fighting against him. And often in life, that's what happens. Is we're fighting to try to get it right on our own instead of saying, okay, I'm going to just go ahead and give it all to you, Lord. We're trying to fight. And, 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 you know, we're wrestling with God. We're fighting God. God says, if you could just lift up your hands. If you could just say, hey, you know what? This situation is hopeless without you. 
I cannot get this done. I can't fix my marriage. I remember me and, me and Elena, we got married in 2010, and we argued everywhere we went. Not in front of everybody. You know, you jump out and say, hey, how you doing? All right. Praise God. Y- y'all doing good? Yeah, yeah, God is good. <laughs> Praise him. Get back in the car, and we're like, where do we, we pick up? Where were we at again? Start arguing all over. And we start arguing all over again. I mean, we argued all the way to this place where we were supposed to pray for this couple, right? Which we did, right? It was a newlywed couple. My pastor said, hey, go over there and pray for them and pray for their house. Yes, sir. We argued all the way over there, got over there, prayed for them. I mean, ooh, the prince of God just saturated that apartment, boy. They were like, ooh, they were crying and stuff. And then we jumped right back in the car and started arguing again all the way home. It wasn't until I said, man, I don't know how to be no husband. I don't know how to be a Christian husband. I don't know how to be a Christian husband. I'm dead in this area. God gave him, okay. He's attracted to us being weak. Don't think that God is attracted to you having it all together. Don't think that God is attracted to you having all the answers. That's why we're asking questions. Because the questions you ask determines the answers you'll get. It's okay. It's okay not to be okay. See, most of the time we try to put up this front like we got it going on, like we're okay. God's like, okay, once you realize you don't, then I'll come swoop in. And I'll come and fill your house with my glory. I'll fill your marriage with my presence. I'll fill your family with hope again. But it's only until you realize you're dead in this situation. I mean, you can do nothing. We read the scripture but it's hard to really process it. The Bible says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And this is how we think. Nah, come on now. I can do something. Come on, God. I mean, just, I mean what you trying to say? You're dead. And I need to resurrect you. Apart from me, God says, You can do nothing. And when I read that, I don't know about you, you know, because I have some form of leadership skills, so I I know he ain't talking to me about all the way, right? He's not saying that to me. Some of us think like, no, I can do something. When I read it, that's that's how, and God has to break me and says, no, Billy. (laughs) You can do nothing. Yeah, even those leadership skills, that's me. And you better recognize that's not you. And the time that you think it is you is a time when I'm going to have to bring you a base. I'm going to bring you a load. And I'm going to have to resurrect you all over again. Because you don't realize this is all me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What if we could know Jesus on a deeper level? Well, I think we can. But it's going to take a few things. It's going to take us remembering where Jesus found us and remembering what Jesus done for us, remembering that we cannot save ourselves. And it's going to cause us to have to reevaluate our lives. Do I spend time with the Lord like I should? Do I even want to go deeper with Jesus? You have to reevaluate that. How much of Jesus do I want? Maybe I don't even want that much. And maybe you want to come to that conclusion. It's okay. You just got to identify how far do I want to go? Because Paul said, man, I don't, I, I want to know all of you. And then after you reevaluate, say, okay, but well, this is what I want. Let me go ahead and refocus. Let me refocus my life. Let me refocus. Let me get my perspective right. Because some of us, we have these cognitive biases. We have these, these filters. We have these perspectives that we carry because of our past pain, our past hurt. Can't even get in a relationship with somebody because you, when you get in a relationship, you think they somebody that you used to be with. And you treat them like what that guy did or what she did. And it's like, whoa, 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 hold up. You need to refocus. Because everybody is going to get affected by your past because you have not refocused. And maybe you just realize, need to realize you need a resurrection. This life that you've been living, what if... This is not even the life that God asked you. What if he has something more? 
And let me tell you this. Some people think that more is for the selected few. More is for everybody. You're a Christian. You got Jesus living in you. The God who created the universe. We just got to break through these, these strongholds, these battles, these poverty mindset. And poverty, not even talking about money, but just, you know what I'm saying, the poor way of thinking. Because God has more for everyone in here. Everyone. And so we have to resurrect from that. So today as I close up, I want to pray for every person. Whether you're online or whether you're here in person. I pray today that Jesus would be the focus. He would be the focal point. He would be the person that we will remember. That we will reevaluate our lives and our priorities around Jesus. We'll refocus. We would cleanse our lens so we can see clearer, so we can see people clearer. Maybe you need a second touch. Jesus actually healed a blind man, and when he, when, he, when he first opened his eyes, he seen people like trees. They were just objects. Maybe you see people just to be used or people, uh, you know, as objects, someone you can get something out of. You don't see them as a real person that need to be loved. Maybe you need to refocus, get a second touch from the Holy Ghost. So you can see him again. Jesus touched his eyes again, and then he's seen him properly. He could see clear. Maybe you need to refocus your life. Maybe you need to pray this today that you have a resurrection. That this would take place inside of you. That you will remember, reevaluate, refocus, and resurrect. Father, I'm praying in the name of Jesus for every heart every person that can hear the sound of my voice. I'm praying that we would have a resurrection, that our dreams, our aspirations, our desires, the things that we pursued when we were young, the things that you have placed in our hearts, the passions that you have given us, help them be resurrected today in the name of Jesus Christ, that they will resurrect, that we would have hope again that we will refocus and we will reevaluate and we will remember the things that you have done for us and the words that you told us. I speak blessing and favor and I pray that you would shine your face on every person here. That your glory would rest among their marriages, in their relationships, in their families, Lord, in their finances, on their faith, oh God. That today would be the day that we go deeper with you, Jesus. Lord, we're asking for you to bless our lives for real in the name of Jesus. Fresh experience, fresh encounter. Help us to have the greatest knowledge of all, knowing you, oh God. We thank you, we love you, and we give you glory in Jesus' name. 